Okay, my name is Slade Mitchell. Um, I come from Comcast. Uh, I work for a uh, software, advanced software development group there that uh, has over the last five years or so been working on the latest and greatest version of the user experience that our customers get. Um, our world is a little bit of a departure for uh, Comcast. Uh, historically, Comcast Cable has been an importer of software and other technologies. They didn't really kind of build things and send them out. They were relied on vendors to do everything. So about 2009, uh, a small organization, a startup within a large company was created. Uh, it's had various names over time. Um, I can never get them all straight, so I either call them X1 or Excalibur if I talk about those things or the same thing. Um, and uh, I joined uh, Comcast in Philadelphia in about 2009 to kick this off. In the ensuing few years, uh, we have sort of grown quite a bit, uh, not only in terms of people, uh, but in terms of what we provide to Comcast. Uh, that's just sort of a pictorial representation of, we have actually changed uh, a significant portion of Comcast's customer experience. Uh, we now represent the, the main user experience that gets shipped off to Comcast customers. Uh, that's a lot of customers. Um, and we have turned uh, part of what we do into software development sort of technology exporting. Um, so the, the platform that we've been building, this thing that we call X1, um, is there really to serve uh, multiple partners, not just Comcast. We're building it as a platform uh, that can be syndicated, not a bespoke Comcast solution. And that's important because it really does change things within Comcast. This is all a little bit relevant, I, I think, hopefully for the talk in the sense that I'm gonna use some examples uh, from our world to talk about some of those partial failures that we've encountered and some real failures that we've encountered. Uh, so I'm hoping to give a little bit of sort of context for some of these examples that I may give. And very briefly, I could spend hours and hours talking about what X1 does and how it's built. And if anybody's interested afterwards, I'm happy to bore you to tears. But uh, very, very briefly, I think, again, setting up for some of the examples we're going to talk about, uh, just want to talk very briefly about uh, what some of our architecture looks like. Um, so we deliver experiences, not only to televisions through set-top boxes like people are used to, uh, but obviously we've encountered the internet world and we're delivering experience obviously through mobile clients as well. Um, there is a difference uh, in our world though that matters uh, for us, particularly with regards to the topic of this conference, uh, scale and performance, and that is for our set-top box customer experience, the user experience is actually not running in the set-top box itself. Uh, this is a change, of course, in the old days. You had very, very dumb set-top boxes, very, very small memory footprints, very, very simplistic user experiences. Uh, and they didn't have network connections into them for all intents and purposes. There was a, an inbound data pipe that these old set-top boxes were able to use to get their guide data and stuff like that, but it was very small and it was broadcast one way only. Uh, so the new world has arrived. We have set-top boxes that have high-speed two-way connections. Um, as part of that, the devices have become more capable, which is great because we can do all kinds of better user experiences on them. Uh, but we made a choice, and I'm not going to get into the details of why or all the reasons of good or bad and so forth because, there's again, we could spend hours debating whether this is a good idea. Um, but in this new world of these advanced set-top boxes, the user experience that the customer is encountering and using is actually running in VMs out in our data centers. They're not running as applications on the silicon on the set-top box. Uh, unlike, of course, mobile applications where that really doesn't make sense. So mobile applications are still a more traditional uh, application where it's relying on data that's coming from our back-end data centers. Uh, but the, the, the state is still maintained within the device itself, within the application. Uh, so that, again, the, the, the set-top box one at the top really matters for us with regards to the scale, performance, and stability of our back-end data centers, because uh, bluntly, if that's not working, if the network goes down, or there's trouble with our servers on the back-end, or they have bugs, or whatever else, your user experience stops. And it is as extreme as your remote control key presses are not going to do anything, uh, because the state of your interaction is actually held in VMs in the cloud, they're not held locally in the set-top box. <clears throat> um, sounds like a bad thing. One of the side effects of it, though, is when problems happen, we can fix them very quickly. We don't have to fix them by shoving software out into millions of set-top boxes in people's homes. Uh, we can generally fix most problems and issues by fixing our software in the back end. Uh, and I guess the only other thing to point out here, 
uh, is that on our back end, we do have a bunch of services. Uh, I'm gonna make no attempt, of course, to enumerate them, uh, but generally speaking, the data sets in particular that both the mobile clients and the set-top boxes are running off of um, are the same. Uh, the way each of those applications get to their data um, and how much of a, <coughs> pardon me, how much of a network is in between those two states varies, but otherwise they're generally running off the same data. Uh, one last kind of preamble thing. Uh, we have a slightly unusual uh, world uh, in the world of uh, video. So there's really kind of two worlds of video you can think about. You can think about the Amazon and Netflix and iTunes type model, uh, which I'm gonna make an inflammatory statement, which I'm kind of known for, uh, that they've got a pretty simple model, really, that they have to deal with. And their simple model, simple model, a little bit inflammatory, um, is that they're just basically dealing with video on demand. There's a file that was constructed at some point in time in the past, it's hosted on a CDN, they have to make sure that they get that file out to the endpoint so somebody can play something back, but there's all kinds of caching semantics they can take advantage of in between. Uh, we, of course, also have video on demand as part of our service framework, uh, so we you know, have basically the same advantages there. However, one of the differences for us is we also have linear video. Uh, so this is the watching scheduled television that we all still do, uh, and in staggering numbers of hours per week. When, when I hear the, the stats that come out of, out of our uh, you know, business folks, it just boggles my mind that people watch so much television. But that's, that's neither here nor there. I'm, I'm not one of those people, but that's, that's beside the point. Uh, in any event, uh, we have a top and a bottom of the hour uh, scenario in linear video that almost nobody else uh, encounters. And what, that's obviously because at the top of the hour, programs change. The bottom of the hour, programs change. When programs change, people grab the remote and they start interacting with the UI. If you recall, I'll just go back a step. If you recall the diagram I just showed, right? Mobile clients, not a lot of consumption of linear video on mobile clients, but set up boxes, a huge amount of consumption of video. And if you consider that all of those remote key presses are going back to servers in the cloud, all at the same time, roughly, because you're talking a very, very narrow window of time at the top and bottom of the hour when people interact, uh, there's some real scale and reliability and performance considerations there that we have uh, learned the hard way uh, and are still learning how to navigate. Uh, what else? No, I guess that's all I needed out of that. So that, that was, a, like I said, just a little bit of preamble to kind of set the stage for some of the, some of the use cases that we've encountered around this space and, and, and why we care. So let's get into failures. So failures isn't really a very happy topic. Of course, we all face them all the time. Um, I'd make the argument that there's a distinction, at least in my mind, between failures, full-on failures, and partial failures. So this is a full-on failure. Anybody recognize it? I hope so. We're tech enough that hopefully we're familiar with the Falcon 9. Um, it's unfortunate that we're probably familiar with this incident with the Falcon 9, or the most recent attempted launch of the Falcon 9, and let me see if I can remember the term, which went through rapid unscheduled disassembly, which is one of my favorite terms. <clears throat> I haven't been able to use it at, at work yet, because uh, fortunately all our stuff is software, it's not really physical, but that's a failure, right? Pretty obvious, it's hard to miss. In contrast, this is a failure. This is a partial failure. There's actually really a couple parts of this partial failure. First of all, it's not sitting in my driveway. But beside the fact that it's not sitting in my driveway, Every time this thing makes a hard right-hand turn, the engine cuts out. Turns out, there's a wiring harness problem. Only when you're doing a hard right-hand turn does the wiring harness get pulled in such a way that one of the wires separates, cuts the engine. Can you tell by looking at it? No. Can you tell by 98% of the use cases of the thing running? No. Can you only figure it out when you're doing that right hand, hard right-hand turn? Yes. So I, in the physical world, right, this is kind of a drag. Uh, because it's hard to find. And again, I'm gonna kind of argue that, that uh, physical, or, uh, rather full failures are a bad thing, no doubt about it. Partial failures are also a bad thing, but they could be worse. So here's some uh, miscellaneous diagrams. Hopefully it's not hard to find the partial failure in that mess of diagrams. I'm sorry, I meant to say the full failure in, the, in that mess of diagrams in the upper left-hand corner. That's a bad day. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of why it was a bad day, but just trust me, it was a bad day. <clears throat> the, the one on the bottom, eh, fortunately we're humans, so we can see that and say, well, God, that's either a really, really abrupt full failure and a really abrupt recovery, uh, or something else is going on. 
right? Of course, in this case, it was a logging problem, not, a, not an actual failure of the system problem. Top right-hand corner, a little less clear, right? Um, in a world where we have variations, uh, there could actually be problems in the middle of that noise. As it turns out, there are. There's at least a couple of places where there are problems in that noise. But if you're just looking at it, tough to tell. Uh, just because the signal isn't super clear. Full failure, clear signal. Partial failure, less clear. Um, so full failures, you can encounter data loss, you can encounter data corruption, loss of experience, those sorts of things. Again, they're gonna be pretty abrupt and pretty obvious generally. Partial failure, kind of same thing. Data loss, data corruption. You can get an inconsistent, inconsistent user experience. Some people may experience a full, out, full outage. Uh, but again, in partial failures, it may take you a while to figure out what it is. And while you're trying to figure out what it is, you may be incurring even more data loss or even more data corruption than you would have in a full, full on failure. One of, my, one of the things that keeps me up at night, almost literally, uh, related to our system, because we hold the data for so many customers, uh, is data pollution, right? If we end up getting partial failures that are kind of you know, messing with data, but we don't catch it for a little while and it messes more and more and more data up and let's say hypothetically it's screwing up people's DVR recordings, but we really don't notice it, then over time, we may even, if, it's, if it goes long enough, you could even start polluting your backups or other recovery mechanisms, right? It, it's all about how, how quickly you can identify what the problem is and, and remediate it. Uh, and of course, partial failures are probably a precursor to a full failure. Not always, uh, but often. Okay, so, uh, Back in the day, or actually maybe not even back in the day, there's still cases where this is true. Um, if you are running an application that's kind of all within the same application address space, partial failures are way less hard to happen, right? Generally speaking, if something's gonna fail, it's probably gonna take the app down, right? You're not gonna have a partial failure of a module down inside of a same memory space app. As soon as we introduced process boundaries, this starts to become more of a problem, right? There are more things that can go wrong. You could have difficulty on either the caller side or the callee side, the module side. Uh, you could have a problem about just intercommunication between the processes. More points of possible problem, more likelihood for partial failure. And then in a world of microservices, which is great and painful at the same time, that just multiplies, right? We now have all kinds of clients coming from all sorts of networks, right, into all sorts of services that either themselves are discrete endpoints or themselves may have a ton of interdependencies. And consequently, the likelihood or the opportunity for partial failures somewhere in that chain, not necessarily the entire chain falling down, but something along the, along the line uh, is significantly increased. So um, as it turns out, in the uh, mid-90s, there's some guys at Sun that, talked to, that wrote a paper around sort of distributed computing and, and failure modes. And one of the things that they said is that when you are starting to deal with distributed systems, you need to think about things differently than you did before, right? So this is, um, oh, and, and I guess the, oops, there we go. And if you're gonna do that, you gotta take it seriously. When they were writing this, I think it was sort of the, they were basing a lot of their conversations on kind of CORBA patterns. So if you're familiar with CORBA patterns, you have a caller, you have an object that represents what you wanna do, right? There's a framework that's gonna deal with that. In the CORBA, CORBA land, you, you end up sort of writing, or in many cases, you end up writing as if you are executing locally. And it's the framework's job to figure out whether that thing is executing here or executing somewhere else. But as a result, if you are, implementing local, with a local first pattern, then you are gonna exclude from your software all sorts of failure cases, or potential failure cases. Because it's kinda not part of what you're worrying about. You're delegating that off to the framework. Um, but they can still happen. So part of what they're arguing is that that's a bit of a problem. Um, and rather, now, today, we, we, so we've migrated past that. I don't think anybody here probably uses Corva too much. Nobody? Nobody? Oh, good. <laughs> um, today, basically, we're in a, in a world where we really have to turn that on its edge and have, it's, I'm certain that all of us are following this pattern, is generally speaking, implement remote first, right? So we just assume that everything is at the other end of a pipe, it's at the end of, other end of a connection, 
And thus, we have to anticipate that there are some sets of failures that will happen that are related to the fact that it is that the, what we're calling is executing remote. And we may do a good job of this, or we may do a bad job of this. That's sort of immaterial. But the pattern sort of has to start being this remote first thinking. In the event that you happen to be calling something and it happens to be deployed on the same machine, excellent, lucky for you. The likelihood of the network failure is gonna be lower for you in that particular case, but that should be treated as an optimization, not as something you rely on generally. <clears throat> okay, so I wanna talk about some very sort of simplistic partial failures just to kind of set up for a couple of things that we've done to, to deal with some of these. And, Again, the world of, of failures is vast. I'm gonna make no attempt to cover all the possible use cases or all the possible scenarios of, of failure, and thus I'm gonna kind of focus on some pretty simple one, and I acknowledge that. <clears throat> but it kind of just sets up for some of the conversations. So, pretty simple. Client calls server, server never gets the, res never gets the request. Right? What the heck is going on on the client? Client doesn't know what current state is. <clears throat> client calls server, gets to server, Server doesn't respond for whatever reason. Client calls server, server does its work. Server responds, never gets to the client. <clears throat> client gets to server, server takes a heck of a long time to respond. Client says, I'm out of here, it took too long, right? I'm getting somewhere with all this, just bear with me. <clears throat> and uh, another in this vein, client gets to server, server does its work, responds, takes a really long time to get back because there's some sort of a network issue. Client says, takes too long, I gotta abandon you. And there's all kinds of places, that, and people have talked at this conference about the value of timing out and going and doing something else, but we'll get into maybe some of those conversations in a second. But the result of all of those is more or less the same. From the client's point of view, I have no idea what the state is. Right? I can't actually tell the difference between any of those things. They may have succeeded, they may not. It may have processed, it may be not. But I, as a client, can't tell. And incidentally, I'm sidestepping like server respond with server 500 or any of those sorts of things. This is, that is not what these use cases are. These are the use cases of client doesn't actually know what state was in the server. Um, so then what, right? The most common answer is retry. Right? Retry all the things, I love that meme. Anyway, <clears throat> um, and that might be the right thing or it might not be the right thing. It really kind of depends, right? So, so for some of those use cases, for the first two in particular, it's probably okay. Right, never reached the server anyway, so why not retry it? It's not like the server can be in a different state than you're expecting. Again, the client doesn't really know from those, just this set of use cases I'm describing, the client doesn't really know that that's what happened on the back end. Uh, but if you did, then presumably things would be okay. The other three, kind of depends. <clears throat> um, like, are they gonna, is it gonna work? Is it not gonna work? Again, as the client, I really can't tell that I'm one of those three, so, Looking at this, I guess I've got about a 40% chance of success. <clears throat> so the retrying can be safe, cannot be safe. But, um, but it's really common, obviously. We've all got retry code in our implementations. If you're gonna do retrying, and I'm hoping that everybody's learned this lesson already, and if you haven't, boy, this is a good lesson to learn. Back off is your friend, right? If you are retrying, don't just retry and then retry again, and then retry again, and retry again, and retry again, with no back off or no limits, right? You will hurt yourself badly. And hypothetically, this is speaking from experience, but I'm not really gonna get into the details. But, but the, the, the retry, great. The opportunity for retrying is you could actually get or accomplish what you're trying to do in the first place. The downside to retrying is you could make your life way, way worse than it would have been if you, that one transaction hadn't gone through. <clears throat> so, and this is something that we, uh, use, I, I was about to say religiously, probably not religiously, but we use uh, very consciously in our world is when we do encounter retry things, exponential back off is a key part of the way we approach these problems, right? If you don't do something like exponential back off, you will just, well, you, not automatically, but you definitely run the risk of making your system fall down hard. And the, if taken to an extreme, depending on you know, how much traffic and how many people are trying to retry, you could hypothetically swamp your network so that you can't even get to the nodes that are in trouble to rectify them, right? If you have enough nodes that are all trying to do the same thing and you have servers trying to handle those and you've got a network trying to take all this traffic, 
you could actually lock everything up so hard that you cannot get to it to remediate. Um, in, in a world of physical hardware, maybe I can go over and I can mash some power buttons. In a world of VMs, a lot harder. Again, this is slightly a hypothetical example, though not really. Okay, moving on. What's your timeout set to, by the way? No, I'm just kidding. <coughs> um, okay, so idempotence. <coughs> idempotence is obviously a pattern for this, right? If you're lucky, you can implement your application with idempotence capability. And this is the math, I love this, I came across this somewhere. This is the mathematical formula for idempotence, who knew? Um, but I also came th across something more entertaining. Uh, this was a tweet, not that long ago actually, about two weeks ago, it was kind of fortuitous, um, related to distributed systems. Right, so it's kind of like the, what's the hardest problem in software, only different. Uh, so exactly once delivery, guaranteed order of messages, exactly once delivery. If the guy had a perfectly idempotent system, this would not be a problem, right? Uh, unfortunately, perfectly idempotent systems don't exist, well, yeah, pretty much don't exist in a world where we have distributed systems. On the top, if you have a very simple system, one client, one server, idempotence, I'm not gonna say it's easy to solve for, but it's way easier to solve for, right? You don't have a lot of variables to deal with. On the bottom, if you have a client that's talking to a bunch of servers and they themselves are talking to a bunch of other servers and you have multiple servers to talk to, making that idempotent, especially if it's deployed across multiple locations, seriously challenging. Now, in our world, we host user experience, as I was talking about before. We host data for lots and lots of mobile clients. We host user experiences for millions of set-top boxes. Um, so our world is distributed. So I'm gonna go through a quick example, and it's, it's not rocket science, but it's uh, just a quick illustration of one of the places this matters to us. So we have a mobile application, right? We are a television or a video delivery business. Uh, DVR is a pretty important thing in that world, right? So we have a client and I can find application, or not applications, I can find a program that I wanna record and I can tell it to record. <clears throat> and when I do so, in our world we have many data centers, right? And those data centers host the services. We run hot, 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 uh, disaster recovery kind of isn't a noun for us. Um, and thus, my request is gonna go to one of those data centers. So it goes to one of the data centers and it says, hey, I'd like to record the voice. And it ends up on one of the data centers and the data center says, okay, fine. I'm gonna keep track of the fact that you're gonna record the voice. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, if we encounter a network partition, then data center B got the request. It has the new data, it has the new state. Data center A is not getting replicated to. It does not have the new state. Uh, and we have separation of the data, right? Now what happens when that application, maybe it relaunches to find my recordings or whatever, and it hits the other data center. We don't, we don't do data center affinity or anything like that in, the, in what we do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this case, it asks, and of course the data's not there. <clears throat> Oops, wrong way. Uh, so it retries all the things, and it writes again, which is great, except those may be slightly different values, right? So our challenge then is, what does this look like? Right? And I'm just showing two data centers. We have the equivalent of many more than two. Uh, so replication across five or six or seven different data domains makes the problem even harder. The likelihood of some sort of part, uh, network partitioning larger. Um, and the question really comes down to this. So in order for this to be idempotent, uh, we could either do a lot of work on the sort of software stack or we can cross our fingers and hope that the reconciliation capabilities between our data persistence layers helps us with this. We tend to, as it turns out, we use Cassandra on the back end of this. Cassandra has tunable models for reconciling anything from the simple last one in wins to something you code up yourself. Uh, fortunately, to date, we haven't really gone down the path of coding anything ourselves because uh, I'm not really sure that we're ready to deal with that level of complexity. Um, but this is a real thing, right? So depending on the technology you're working on the back end, this may or may not be easy. Again, Cassandra has a way, SQL Server has a way with log shipping, every one of the databases will have some mechanism for doing that, and it'll either be simple or it won't. And if it isn't, I don't have an answer for you. Like, it'll very much depend on your application and the technology you're using behind it of how readily you can deal with the potential for inconsistent data in, this, in a case like this. So that's kind of like a non-example in the sense of 
it's not an example of how to solve this problem. It's more a reflection on uh, a pretty common one as a result of the world of microservices and distributed applications. Um, and that conversation was sort of more along the lines of avoiding problems, right? So the idea of having an idempotent system is that if something goes wrong, in the end, the system sort of salt, sort, sort, oh, sorts itself out uh, to kind of avoid the failure. But like, failure's gonna happen. Don't try, and, don't try and pretend you're gonna be able to avoid failure. Just get on with it. Um, so in addition to, no, that doesn't say don't spend some effort trying to make sure that you don't fail. I mean, of course, you'd be silly not to invest some effort in trying to avoid it. <clears throat> but you, you have to invest almost as much time and effort in accepting that it's gonna happen and anticipating how you're gonna deal with it when it does. So as it turns out, uh, Netflix has done a great job of this, right? Um, they have tools that they have built for use themselves. Uh, lucky for all of us, they have made those tools available to others, um, either on the historic side of things, either on the kind of application side, trying to catch things before they get too bad. Uh, but my favorite actually is the Simian Army stuff, which is sort of saying, look, engineers will do as best they can to either avoid the problem or uh, prepare for the problem, but like, you shouldn't trust that. It's not because of deficient, any deficiency in engineering, it's just that you can't anticipate really what's gonna happen unless you go through it. And the Simian Army, of course, as we should all be familiar with, um, is all about proving that you can deal with failures. This is about throwing failures into your system at various levels <clears throat> to make sure that your code actually is resilient to it. I would love to say that we're using this stuff universally through everything that we do <clears throat> successfully, uh, but unfortunately, I'd be optimistic about saying that. Um, this is something I keep trying to encourage us to do, uh, but it is a bit of an uphill battle um, in a world where you're not starting from Greenfield. Uh, and I, I, again, I could spend a whole bunch of time talking about what it means to grow a high-tech business in the middle of something that isn't, uh, but that's an entirely different set of conversations that we'll leave for another day. So anyway, subtext here is use the tools if, if you can. The only way that you know that you are capable of taking an outage is take an outage. And that's either by using these sorts of tools or doing yourself. So we don't tend to use these automated, they're gonna run on their own tools, but we run fire drills in our world regularly. And what we'll do is we'll have human-based drivers for knocking out some servers or introducing some network problems. Not quite as complicated and mature as these tools, <clears throat> but we actually do test to make sure what's gonna happen when we lose some servers or lose a data center or lose connectivity between things. Uh, and it's quite interesting what you will reveal and learn from doing that exercise that you just assumed wasn't gonna be a problem because why would that ever happen? Uh, it's kind of a painful lesson, but it's way the heck less painful to learn it in those situations than in a full on sev. Having been there on both sides, I can attest to that. I'm sure like everybody here can attest to it. Unfortunately, we can all attest to it. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to a slightly different topic. So there's another uh, sort of philosophy or premise that we really lean into, and that's last known good. And it's, that's the term that we use internally. It's, it's really not necessarily any more complicated than sort of the, the pattern of caching. But, but, um, but I'm gonna just describe one in one of the ways that we approach this in particular uh, related to our, our, our set-top box experience. So, First, get the general caching pattern out of the way. So we're all familiar with this, right? HTTP caches as a proxy in the middle. My service goes away. I'll return whatever I was holding on to last, pending whatever the cache headers are. So those sort of straight up proxy cache of literal payloads, pretty straightforward. We're all familiar with them. Um, there are other use cases, though, that start to get a little bit more complicated that aren't just straight up holding on to, to data, pattern, uh, data payloads. So in our world, and, and here if you, I probably should have done this in the slides, but that doesn't matter at this point. Here if you envision client as a set-top box, server as that application server running in the cloud that has all the state of your application, 
and then the dependent services as all of those other services in our back end that are required to run that UI. And when I say that all of those other services, it's more than two, right? Like there's a whole bunch of services that are required to run a user experience for a set-top box. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, you can imagine that a request from the set-top box or a remote control key press from the set-top box is gonna cause that service to go and gather a bunch of information from some number of dependent services, um, do something with that data, and return a response that is some derivative of the data that was gathered from those dependencies. That's what that's illustrating. <clears throat> if we lose one of them, then in a simplistic view, well, I can't return everything, right? Um, and again, I, I wanna stress that in our world, this is a derivative of the data, not just taking the payload that I got from dependency C and just slapping it into the setup box. I actually have to do processing on all of these things, emerge them in some way. So this would be a problem. So what we've introduced is our last known good caching model uh, that we internally call min data um, for reasons you can probably figure out. Um, and its job is to be a place where we can store uh, similar to the HTTP caching model that we just described, but slightly modified the data from our dependencies. So this will look familiar to everybody in terms of what a, like an HTTP look aside cache might look like. And that's more or less what it is. Except again, the data that we're storing here isn't necessarily the straight up responses from A, B, C, or D. Uh, in some cases it's, actually in some cases it is, but in other cases is also a persistence of derivative data related to all of that. So in this case, of course, if we lose dependency C, <clears throat> then the application will get the latest and greatest from A, B, and D, and we'll return the last known good portion from C, composite all of that into a response. Uh, oh, I should have, I'm sorry, I should have gone one back. Uh, well, I guess it's, it's, it's basic look aside cache, right? So when the service is getting that initial request, it's gonna gather up all the A, B, and C, and D data, and then it's gonna look aside push into the cache the bits that it needs. So move back onto this. Um, we rely on this quite heavily. So if you can kind of remember that original slide that I had, set the boxes don't have any state in them. They rely on applications running in servers in the cloud that have all of the state. One of the things that I didn't describe is the way that mechanism works is there are live, long-running TCP connections between the setup box and the server. The reason that matters is that is not an HTTP pattern, right? This is a, I connect to a particular server, to a particular instance running on a VM, and I'm gonna be stuck to that guy for as long as my session lasts. As long as the setup box doesn't lose a network connection or until it gets rebooted. <clears throat> that matters because if something does happen, if I do lose a network connection or the set the box reboots or something like that, I'm gonna come back in, I'm gonna reconnect to the back end and I'm gonna end up on a completely different server, possibly on the other side of the country, and I'll have lost all of my state because all the state was on the west coast and I now have a connection to the east coast. This, if it was all just local, doesn't necessarily help me in that use case, right? So I was on the west coast, I did my look aside cache, my look aside cache is on the west coast, I connected the east coast, ah, oh, crap. <clears throat> So the, the, the reason that we take this approach and the reason it isn't the same as a straight up HTTP cache is we take that min data model and then we are actually persisting that min data in Cassandra. We do it for a couple of reasons. One is the obvious. We get the replication across our data centers out of it. Uh, another reason is the volume of data that we actually cache in our last known good cache is huge. Um, part of the point of running last known good, the way we do it, is if we have a network segment between our front-facing server pool, which is what's actually serving requests coming in from set boxes, and all of our back-end infrastructure, because they're in different, they could be, and are in many cases, deployed in different deployment locations and different data centers, <clears throat> then we can continue to drive a substantial, not 100% of, but a substantial portion of someone's user experience just on the last known good data that we have held in our min data system. Now, of course, there's still a chance that will have problems between our services and the min data system, but the number of likely points of failure there is significantly lower. I only showed four dependencies there. It's probably in the order of 25 or 30 or 50 different services that we actually rely on in the real world. Um, so this is a really important thing for us. Um, this isn't, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the, I didn't mention this before, but I will now, one, one of the 
interesting problems that we face um, as part of a company delivering services to someone's television is that for 50 years, people have been building expectations of what their television does, right? You mash the remote control button, the thing's gonna respond. You're not gonna get a 404. Right? What was the last time you got a 404 on your TV? Actually, if any of you are Comcast customers, you would have got an equivalent of a 404 at some point in your TV, and we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> um, but, it, but there's this expectation that we are facing with our customer base that sort of hasn't grown up in the world of the web. If you go to Netflix and you try and play something, and this happens to me all the time, and I'll get an error if it's not available right now, or it'll take a really long time for the page to load, or whatever, and I'm not gonna call up Netflix and say, I want my $7 back, right? Like, it's just not the pattern. They start off from the web, they have web semantics in mind when people use it, they get a buy. We're on the, <clears throat> pardon me, we're on the television, we have television semantics that we have to deal with. It's important for us to be able to deliver as much of that user experience as we can, even in the nature of outage. Okay, so anyway, that's belaboring the point, I guess, a little bit, but, but the point of this is, uh, by doing this look aside model, and by distributing that cache across our data centers, uh, we can actually take some substantial outage on the back end and still deliver a bunch of user experience. Okay, I'm gonna shift to uh, another topic now. So, graceful degradation, this is another this is another pattern for obviously dealing with, with outages. So this could be your data center. I mean, hopefully it's not. Um, it hasn't been any of my data center. Actually, has anybody ever gone through one of these, like seriously full on data center melting down besides logical? No? Okay, good, we're all lucky. How many people have gone through a cable cut? That's gotta be, yeah, all right. A couple of us have gone through cable cuts. Yes, I've gone through a cable cut. Honestly, no really big difference between a cable cut and this. The only difference is how long it takes to recover. <laughs> okay, but anyway. So, if you go through an event that basically knocks out your data center, that's not your customer's problem, right? Your customer should be insulated from that. In Twitter land, fail well. We're all familiar with fail well, that's great. <clears throat> so they have a shingle, or this is what the terminology we use at least, is shingles. So the fail well shingle, very popular. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen quite as much now that all of us have been maturing over time. In our user experience, the lower right-hand corner is, a, is an older version of, a, of, of our user experience um, in X1 we also have shingles, right? We don't have a 404 across your entire user experience shingle. We have granular shingles depending on what's failing. So if you consider back in that couple of examples I gave a second ago, if dependency C is going down, maybe dependency C is uh, we can't create new recordings right now. So if you get somewhere where you're trying to create a new recording, <clears throat> we may throw a shingle that sort of says that piece isn't right, available right now. But if you want to navigate VOD or you want to see what your current recordings are or any of these other parts of the user experience. We'll let you do those just fine, but we'll throw granular shingles on the bits and pieces that we can. Now this is something that I should point out that has taken us a while to, to sort of fault into as we've encountered problems. In the very, very early days we didn't have this, so when things came down, they came down hard. Um, we learned very quickly that customers don't like that. <clears throat> so over time, and, and we're still doing this incidentally, we've had to increase our ability to identify granular problems and respond to them granularly. So, and this has caused several things in our world. We've had to increase the number of discrete error cases and conditions that we code for. We have way more error codes now than we used to have, and now those error codes that we have do something specific. We don't have very many cases of unknown error, or uh, in one of the other talks there's like a 0000, zero, zero, zero error or whatever. We don't have too many cases of that, and when we do encounter them and they start creating, excuse me, they start becoming some portion of the errors that we see in our metrics, uh, we, we go and attack it and we start decomposing it down to what the heck are the actual use cases down in there, and we start pulling them out indep independently. <clears throat> so this idea of shingles uh, is important. <clears throat> One of the side benefits of having shingles, not only to the customer in terms of let, letting them do everything else that's going on and not really interrupting their experience, um, is that we can then put metrics around them, right? It's really important for us to be able to identify, wow, geez, look at that. Feature A, doesn't really matter what it is, but feature A clearly is something going wrong with it, right? In the absence of putting metrics on it, and this is, this is a well-worn story for all of us, but in the absence of putting metrics on it, you know, we may wait for like telephone calls coming in from our customer, that's the worst possible scenario is for our customers to tell us about problems. A, because it's pissed them off, and B, because it costs us a lot of money every time somebody picks up the phone and calls us. So please don't call us. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. 
Uh, so anyway, uh, so we lean very, very heavily into, uh, like I said, granular identify, identification rather of what's going on and then putting instrumentation around that so that we can see just as quickly or more quickly than our customers can where they're starting to encounter problems. <clears throat> another, <clears throat> excuse me, another pattern um, is just alternative implementations. And this one really isn't rocket science either, but, but it's worth putting in here. So this is a screen grab from actually a pretty early version of one of our web experiences related to, uh, to our video consumption. And it actually looks okay, right? You've got a bunch of tiles, a bunch of graphics, the Xfinity On Demand Weekly Top 20. All looks great. Trouble is, what's supposed to be there is your weekly top 20. The top 20 that are tuned to the stuff that you like. But for whatever reason, when we went out to grab that, it either took too long, our service wasn't around, or whatever. So we said, oh, crap. And this is in the abs, this is not the same pattern we were talking about a second ago, where we fall back to the last known set of 20 that you had. This is something went wrong. We're going to do a bait and switch. Oh, maybe not a bait and switch. It's maybe not the right terminology. But we're going to do a swap for something that we know we can deliver right away, because really, that changes once a week. So I've got it cached over here. It's static for all intents and purposes, so I can fault that in immediately in the event that I cross some threshold of how long or if a particular portion of my experience is going to fall in. So it's not quite the same as collapsing it down and not showing anything at all, because depending on your user experience, that may actually cause different problems. Um, so this is really just another pattern of dealing with the partial failures. Again, the entire system isn't falling down. I got everything else. It was just this one little piece of the user experience that didn't come through. So I'm just going to replace it with something that I have already. <clears throat> Pardon me. OK. Um, a couple of the things that, uh, that I want to kind of mention as possibilities, although they're, depending on you know, your bent, they may be slightly heretical in the sense of simplification. So we're in a world of microservices. Everybody likes creating hundreds of services. Um, one of our earlier talks, somebody said they've got like, or I, guess, I think it was the Uber guy said he's got about 500 services that the system runs on. So there are probably a couple places where that might not be the right pattern, right? If you've got like a single client, I have some code and it relies on this thing and it's kind of the only guy that's gonna call me and it's kind of the only thing I'm calling, yeah, sure, I could decompose them into services for some reason, but there may be, now this is not all the, always the case, of course, but there may be cases where, why bother? Right? Instead of making your life harder, because every line that you put between services is an opportunity for failure, rather than doing that, consider collapsing them down. Because right? you may actually gain reliability, maybe even some performance, maybe some scale, not too sure, <clears throat> um, for something that really didn't need to be a distributed microservice anyway. Same thing for tight coupling, right? If I, every single time I change service on the left, the service on the right has to change accordingly, or vice versa, right? Every single time I change my dependent service, my calling services have to change. If that is so tightly coupled that I always have to touch both, there's an opportunity for consideration of whether or not it's actually valuable to keep them separate. There may be. There may be really good reasons. The thing on the right may have to scale with a completely different pattern than the, the one on the left. So maybe that's a good reason not to do it. And in, incidentally, that is uh, something that we have definitely encountered in our world, where either the, the service behind it just has to scale massively more than the, the caller, uh, or more likely it's kind of the other way around. <clears throat> uh, but there are going to be cases where that's not true. So, so one of the sort of premises here is Despite the fact that we all like this idea of generating microservices like crazy, because we get paid piecework, right, for the number of microservices we pump out, um, there are cases where that, that might not necessarily be appropriate. Um, <clears throat> so there's another, there's another set of patterns uh, that we use um, that looks slightly, well, it looks similar, actually, to the example I gave a minute ago. Uh, but I'm going to kind of turn it on its head for a second. So this is more or less the example I gave a minute ago. You get a client calling a server. It has a bunch of dependencies. And generally speaking, in that example, I was showing sort of a calling pattern, right? So the client calling the service causes the service to go get the data, and then I showed min data, <clears throat> min data caching the data and so forth. <clears throat> but there are cases where we've actually reversed that, and probably a bunch of you guys have done the same, is to change the pattern to a push pattern rather than a pull pattern, right? So we have <clears throat> introduced in some of our calling patterns a different model, right? Where the dependent services themselves, 
emit notifications of change or other sorts of messaging. We have an event processing component in the stack that's listening to all of that and is gathering up those changes and pushing them out to the service so that the service has, similar to what I was showing before with MinData, but the service has in it uh, a bunch of data uh, that the clients are likely to need. <clears throat> but this is because we did it proactively, not because we did it on demand. So fine, that doesn't sound all that interesting, although it's, it's a useful pattern. Um, where that can become really interesting though, and this is something that uh, I still think that we're, as an industry probably, really not taking enough advantage of. Oh wow, really, okay. Um, is the following. What if all of that data is not going onto disk? What if it's all going to memory on that service that's answering to the clients, right? We have very large blades, have a huge amount of RAM in them. Some of the data sets that we're working with aren't that big. If you use a pattern like this, you can actually pre-populate that thing in memory with all of the data it needs. And then if you do this and replicate it across additional services, so you have a little bit more availability and resilience, <clears throat> you can actually gain performance because you're running out of memory. You can gain scale because you can kind of move the services around. You'll gain availability because if all that stuff in the back end disappears, <clears throat> and the clients will be able to, <clears throat> pardon me, the clients will be able to get to their services and get the data they're looking for. So this is actually something that at Comcast uh, has been implemented in something called the Sirius Library, which has been open sourced by one of our teams. This is the information on how you get to it. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but, but briefly, one of the places that we use this is for the mobile client use cases that I was showing before. So again, the mobile client has an application, it has state, it has to call and get data off the back end periodically. We use this serious pattern to pre-populate the servers that are gonna take those responses so the client isn't sitting there waiting for some fetch off of some back end server to get the data. And what we'll end up doing is one of the examples that we use is we pre-populate that serious data set with all of our guide data. And then if you're asking for something like, what's my list of recordings? <clears throat> we'll go get the list of recordings, we'll just get a bunch of IDs, and then we'll hydrate all of the additional metadata around that out of this memory store so that our response back to the client is super fast and we didn't have to rely on any of that stuff, but we still get personalization from the ID set that came out of the query. And it was good that the, <clears throat> pardon me, so that, like I said, this, this is uh, one of the projects, and there are several, but this is one of the projects that, that Comcast has open sourced. Um, all I wanted to do out of this talk was just to, like I said at the beginning, not provide a comprehensive set of patterns, not provide a comprehensive set of use cases, but to sort of uh, expose some of the use cases that we use and the, some of the patterns that we use to deal with both the set-top box type scale, which is, which is slightly different than the mobile client type scale, uh, kind of in our world. So that's it, thanks. Um, any questions? If I can see. Everybody wants to go home. <laughs> All right, no questions? Thanks very much for listening. Have a good trip home. <laughs>